everyone, and welcome to this first amazing session on agripreneurship. So we know that we're all talking about disruption and innovation, but a lot of students haven't considered the space of agriculture and food as a huge opportunity. And the reality is that we can design all of the apps in the world. If we don't have enough food, how are we going to survive? And I also, what I love about the food and agriculture world is that it brings cultures together because when it comes out to food and travel and tourism, everything is around the space. So we have a very special guest who's doing super well in the space. Pekka, how are you? I'm pretty good. Having a wonderful day today. It's been really, really sunny in the west of Sydney. Yes, amazing. And tell us about your journey. How did you go from data all the way to building like a tech ecosystem to connect chefs? So how was your journey and what does chefing do? Um, I mean, funny enough, I've always been really, really passionate about food since I'm like a kid. Uh, my mom used to sort of give me tasks in the kitchen because if she didn't, by the time she was like trying to cook something, I would just eat all the raw ingredients. Um, I was like one of these sort of round and chubby babies that just love to eat everything. Since I remember myself like four years of age, I've been like cooking in the kitchen, mixing up bowls of like doughs and stuff like that and just preparing sauces or dressings and chopping salads and stuff like that. Just anything that we would eat, my mom would give it to me. So I've always been passionate about food. Uh, but when I sort of um, went to study, um, I went into data and data has been uh, amazing, mm -hmm. actually. It was, uh, it was one of these passions that I discovered through just a random job, job interview. Uh, I was quite open-minded and I've sort of always been open-minded. So I ended up in the data space for, I don't know, many years, almost 15 years I've worked in data. Um, but I've been sort of quite um, handy and interested in doing stuff for a really, really long time, actually. My first solopreneur project was when I was uh, around 10 years old. I really, really wanted to have a computer. Um, so I started sort of saving my daily food budget uh, and buying parts little by little. And uh, when I was 14, I managed to actually build my first computer um, just from all the parts that I collected for the last couple of years. Uh, it was super exciting. I just constantly played like day and night, played games on it. Uh, some basic stuff, to be honest, it was like Super Mario and other things that could play on a 167 megahertz processor, but it was still pretty cool and a really good achievement. And then how did this passion from data and with your early passion for food connect into chefing? What was the moment, the light bulb moment? Where were you? How did you connect the dots or find the problem and start building it into this amazing startup? Uh, I mean, there were sort of a few things that came uh, into play. Um, I, was, I was living in Bonda and uh, a friend of ours was sort of staying with us and we started cooking uh, and creating these dinner parties that just took off at a certain point. There were like almost hundreds of people coming through our house in a week, um, just eating risottos and dumplings and some curries and our barbecues and roasts and different things. And we were like, wow, there is an opportunity here. And I've always loved food, but never wanted to be in a restaurant. Like that's definitely not mm -hmm. something I wanted to do. Um, and the tech space was getting really popular and interesting. So we were like sort of looking at how can we, what are the problems and how we can actually solve it. Uh, yeah. We sort of delved into and identified that what the problems that we wanted to solve were around transparency of what's coming on the table and also people's ability to actually enjoy themselves, talk with each other and have this intimate conversation in private at home while at least enjoying an amazing meal. And that was not really possible in a restaurant or a public sort of environment because you have to take care of your kids, you have to commute somewhere, you have to drive and then you can't drink and drive because at least yeah. in Australia it's illegal. Maybe not yeah. in some other countries, but here's definitely not something you want to do. Um, so then we sort of like, and that coupled up with a really random trip to Hong Kong, where we actually experienced uh, in the chef's home dining, which is something that was born post SARS, uh, which is a funny example to sort of talk about after COVID, right? It's uh, so all the yes. <laughs> in SARS, and the chefs had to cook from their own homes so they can actually make a living. Um, and that's how it sort of started. And we were like, wow, this is amazing. So why don't we send the chefs to people's homes instead mm -hmm. and create that platform that connects the chefs with the, with the diners. Mm -hmm. And if you could go back to day one of when you had the light bulb moment or the moment when you connect all of those dots, what advice would you give yourself? 
I would probably say like this is a sort of a more recent advice or at least a more recently verbalized and sort of conceptualized advice that I've heard from uh, Mike Knapp, who is the ex-co-founder of uh, Shoes of Prey. And it just really grabbed me. And I think it's, it's an amazing piece of advice for anyone that want to do business in their life is to be obsessed with the problem. You just really have to focus on the problem, finding this really, really hairy, really sticky, really big, really nasty problem to solve, basically. And once you found that problem and you have a solution for that problem that actually helps people live their lives better, save money or make more money or whatever it is, your business is guaranteed to succeed basically yes, uh, but that's yeah, the thing. interesting that because people think that entrepreneurship is about like making money and growth but it's not it's about problem solving and you're problem solving a problem for society for your team for the technology predicting what's going to happen it's you're pretty much problem solving all day long and you still need to maintain a positive mindset so talking about problem solving so as an entrepreneur we solve problems 24 hours how do you keep yourself motivated? Because I see you on social media and every time I've written to you, you're like always positive and it's a yes. You've even <laughs> reached out to me and say, Paula, how can I help? And I'm like, look at this. Like these busy entrepreneurs wanting to donate the time. How have you kept yourself so motivated and so positive throughout these? How many years has Shefin existed? Maybe eight or more years? Like it's been many years, Seven. right? Yeah. Seven. Yeah, I remember because it was right about the time we're setting up Academy of Entrepreneurs that you were setting it up. So how have you kept yourself motivated? Because problems are there to be solved, but also some problems are little alerts along the way. They just go, mm -mm, time to spiv it a little bit. How, how have you balanced this problem solving together with your passion and also like molding the business along the last seven years? Um, it's definitely pivoted and changed a lot. There have been really challenging times. Uh, but I think the, the, the single most important thing for motivation for us to remember as human beings is that it's a journey. It's not the destination that matters, it's the journey. So we live our life and funny enough, we come from the ground and we end up in the ground, right? That's something we can't really change. We're going to get born and we're going to die one day. Maybe we can choose what we're going to do in the between. And that's really the, the part we need to enjoy and we need to find a way to sort of love our life and live happy basically. So for me, like problems are actually really exciting. I get very depressed and very scared when there's no problems. Yeah. Uh, it does sort of mean you're worried, that right? That's what I tell students. I'm like, the day you're not worried, stop worrying because something's about to go wrong. Yeah, like I feel like maybe I'm blind. Like I'm just blindly walking somewhere if there's no problems. Like I need to open my eyes and see all the problems and start fixing them. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So talk about problems and solutions. So you being an expert with data, for someone, so a lot of our community that are logging in for this program on agripreneurship, that most of them are first-time entrepreneurs. From your experience, and every business has its own nature, what are some important numbers that our students need to be looking at collecting from day one? Because when you start, you often have posters and a notebook, and you're not recording the process. From your point of view, what is some data that you think it's important from day one for them to start recording and journaling so that they can measure their impact and make the right decisions or also potentially present them to investors? So what are some core numbers that you suggest students to be looking at? It's not just about the numbers, actually. Uh, data mm -hmm. is not really only statistics. It also includes a lot of information like customer details or potential yes. leads or even invest the details. Like um, what I listened very long time ago when I sort of started as well uh, from the founder, Will Davis, the founder of Carnex Door. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice that I heard from him was create your database of investors. Like anyone you approach, anyone you meet, just get yeah. their contacts and email them with your progress every quarter or whatever, message them randomly every couple of months. You know, just have that sort of structure and grid to message the investors. And not about asking money, just updating them of what you're doing. It's the same thing with customers. Like, you always need to collect any leads or customer details. Just collect all of this data. Like, when, when we started, we were just collecting all of it on uh, Google Sheets. Just add the data. Then one day, you're going to have a CRM. It is a pain in the butt to move from Google Sheets to CRM. But to be honest, it's less of a pain in the butt to move when you have the data than create data you don't have because you can't really create data. So just collect the data on the way in the worst and dodgiest way you can, like Google Sheets or sometimes even PayPal. Like I've 
do still use like notebooks and like paper notebooks and stuff. And I do all my writing when I meet people, when I meet investors, I'll write their mobile numbers, I'll write all the information. And these days you can scan it and then upload it to your data bank, which for me is Google Drive. So we collect all the data on Google Drive, on Google Sheets, just manually entering it uh, from metrics or like data points that are the most important, I would say investors or potential investors, uh, customers, potential customers, uh, partners, potential partners. These are probably your three sort of uh, human-centric data time points time. constantly collecting. And then from metrics of your business, mm -hmm. uh, you have some obvious things, right? Like followers, how many people you can reach. Um, but something else that is really, really important to followers is you need to be able to track how many of them you convert. So you want to, from day one, to be able to convert. Funny enough, mm -hmm. when we started Chef and we were converting over 60% of every single inquiry we would get. Uh, and sometimes even higher percentages, you know. Obviously, now when you have more leads, your conversion drops, and we are maybe on 20-something percent of conversion, which is still pretty good. Yeah, but you have to collect all of this data, right? Like you have to collect the data of how many people visit your website, make sure you install your Google Analytics on the website, which is something mm -hmm. we did miss. And I was like, where is the data? I don't have data of how many people are visiting the website, you know? Um, and then uh, another thing that is really, really important that you want to be looking at is how much money you spend versus how much money you make from a customer or what is called customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime values. So they're a bit complicated, but you can always Google the, the formulas. And if you have the underlying uh, numbers, you can actually very easily calculate it. It doesn't really matter. Like I just added customer lifetime value calculation to our reports like a couple of weeks ago, but I had all the data. So it yeah. took me like five minutes to add the formulas and then it's presented for the last seven years. And it's so easy to maintain once you start, right? But it's so hard if you start too late to just go, what do I do? Yes, 100%. Yeah, you know, sometimes it happens that you've missed something. Just forget about it. Just Add it whenever you've remembered and move on. Like there's no point to bang, bang your head and beat your head for a mistake you've done. Like we will make many more mistakes through our, uh, on our way. So we just need to enjoy the journey. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned investors. How has your journey been working with investors? Uh, lots of people have different sort of perspectives in different ways. Like, um, I, I've presented before with Steve Povaromo, who is the founder of Me and You and beforehand of Menulog. He is and amazing. He's one of my favorite entrepreneurs. I just absolutely adore. He's amazing. I didn't know you guys were friends. Please yeah, we presented a couple of times. He's amazing. Yeah. And for him, he says that money are very easy to get. Obviously, he is a successful one-off one exit founder. So for him, it's maybe easier to get. I, I find it quite challenging, but mm -hmm. so there's different points of view from it. But for me, I thought it was quite difficult to get our initial investment. Uh, to get the first investor was really difficult. But once you get the first one, actually, it's much easier. The rest sort of follow through. Um, they're sort of like, I guess, investors really like to follow through. And it makes a lot of sense for them because it costs quite a bit of money to do a due diligence in a company. Um, like, I've sort of calculated it because I'm a numbers person, right? For our first invest, it costed them, costed them close to $100,000 to do a due diligence on us. Uh, and they invested 100K. So really, they've actually put 200K into our business for 100K worth of shares. So small and angel investors actually d don't really have this amount of money to sort of spend and do the first investment. So they rely on angel networks or they rely on referrals, etc. So it's all about getting the word out there, doing as much work as you can, and make sure you are really due diligence ready. So keep your data, organize your files, mm -hmm. and just don't give up. They'll reject you like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that you're saying that, because when I asked you about data, you talked about your investors and your customers, and we had the same journey at Academy of Entrepreneurs. We, we've never had to have investors, which we've been very lucky with. But when we started, we did a lot of market research and we were running a lot of activation events throughout Sydney on promoting like free webinars and masterclasses, face-to-face, -face, networking, happy hours, promoting how to become an entrepreneur, how to turn an idea into a business. So by the time we launched, we had such a big database 
And then the database ended up buying our courses and referring us. So we exploded in sales in day one because we'd already had the data, but it wasn't data data. It was actually a database where we were brainstorming and figuring out like a minimal viable product. And that's the power of building community. And it's where you say when you're deeply in love with the problem you're solving and you're communicating and collecting people's contact details and informing them along the way. Because I remember we would do countdowns and I would share like the mistakes or when we were building the logo, I would give people an Instagram to vote. And everyone's just like, but you're sharing your secrets. And I'm like, if I don't start telling people what we're doing, how would I know if I'm going in the right direction? And then this good like belief and like karma ended up turning into sales. But that's what I've realized now, like in the world, everyone's talking about NFTs, like launching your NFT collection or investing. And a lot of it, we talk about tech, 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 but it's community. The yeah. big successes of NFT is people through a community promoting and through the community that they trust choosing which one to invest. And at the end of the day, that's what business is about, is about people together building a movement and solving a problem, whether you're doing an NFT collection to raise funds for something or launching a, a digital chef platform, e-commerce, <laughs> that is a marketplace that you're connecting. 100%. Question, since you're so involved in the startup and tech world, if you were to start another business in another industry, what industry are you looking at next? Um, I mean, food is definitely a place that people should be looking at. Um, I've been reading lots of, I mean, obviously always reading lots of reports and lots of data, but at the moment, food tech is actually ranked uh, number two after climate tech for the number of deals invested by VCs and investors. So it's probably like when I started like seven years ago, it was maybe a bit too early. It was really, really difficult to convince people to invest in food when they were really going crazy about SaaS businesses and fintech. And then obviously there was this crypto phase and things are going up and down all the time. At the moment, what is really hot is like biotech, uh, climate tech um, and food tech, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of the future for at least for now. You never know, like in three months, it might change <laughs> or like in six months. But that's the way the world is. It's constantly going like up and down and changing. So to be honest, you really need to be passionate about what you're doing. It doesn't matter whether it's a good sector or there's money there at the moment. You just need yeah. to be passionate and be ready to persuade it and have that grit and motivation to continue working on it through the hard and the easy times, basically. So talking about food tech, what are some cool startups that you've seen recently that you went, whoa, that is so unique or it's such common sense. Can't believe I didn't think about that before. Have you seen any food tech startups that have really caught your attention recently? Um, there's a bunch of things actually. What what I really uh, some of the ones I really like are just quite simple, like hyd hydroponic or vertical farms in the city, for example. That is like stunning, and like yeah. people in Sri Lanka, for example, a, a sort of okay. not a very so positive example though. But like when the country bankrupted and they ran out of money, what people started doing is growing their own food at home, and that's probably part of where we're gonna go in the future. Not because everyone's gone bankrupt, but more because the population is growing too much. And yeah, there is a chance that a particular part of the world might be cut off from supplies and there's a much higher chance than what it used to be before. Mm -hmm. Globalization is amazing, but there's pandemics. There could be another disease that comes somewhere and everyone decides no more travel away from Australia and we are closed up here. So we need to be able to be sustainable to grow the food we need within the city where we live and the location where we are. Um, so that kind of farms would be, um, I think, really, really important in the future. I know a couple of guys that actually work on it and they're doing really well. Um, cell sort of based meat is also like a, sort of like, a, a, what is it called? Really interesting as well. Being able to grow a protein like a steak from like just cells in a lab. Um, mm -hmm. It's not sustainable yet. It's quite expensive and resource draining, but it is something that we might be looking in the future in much, much larger scale, to be honest. Like, even if you've watched uh, TV series and movies like Star Trek, where they have this microwave-looking thing, press a button, and they use, like, atoms to synthesize a steak. Yeah, that's really the ultimate goal of where we want to be in the future as a human society, especially if we go in space, right? We're not going to be growing, like, corn on a spaceship. We want to yeah. synthesize the corn in a microwave-looking thing, basically. And robotics, as well, is a really, really interesting one. 
Um, I'm looking at the moment at a couple of um, opportunities around the robotic space um, where we can enhance human labor and reduce the shortages in the kitchen, for example, uh, with robots, automate that processes like chopping carrots. No one wants to chop carrots, right? You can go to, get a robot to do that, frying chicken, doing like chips, or just even monitoring whether the burgers are ready or not uh, through just AI vision, for example. So stuff like that, it's happening in the US already. There's quite a few companies looking at it. Um, Japan is really forehead uh, at the front of any robotics and stuff. Um, so these are very interesting spaces, but there's also like, we should never forget the farmers. You know, it's very important that we highlight and work with the farmers and actually make farming more cool. Because if there's no farmers in the future, there's not going to be any food for us to eat, as you mentioned earlier, right? We all need some- this course because you've got a huge percentage of the world as farmers and you've got a huge percentage of the world starving. The farmers are making enough money. People aren't getting enough food, but we have enough food being produced, but we're not giving it to the right technology to support the farmers to make more money on the supply chain, more sustainable. And also with the different weather conditions that we've got. I mean, the world has gone crazy, right? With like yep. floods and droughts and heats. And you're like, oh my God. Talking about people, what is your like... What's your tip around managing your staff, your chefs, your growth? What have you done to keep your team motivated to hire the right people, to train them throughout the last seven years? What are your, your human resources tips? Because I know that a lot of entrepreneurs, when they set up, they think they need to do it every, they need to be good at everything and they need to do everything. But yeah, you're smiling because you know, the more that you can identify your strengths and weaknesses, the more you can predict your needs and you're building the right workforce, the more you're going to be able to grow and have time as a founder to make the right strategies. Or what we've seen with many of our friends as founders, they pull back from being the CEO, they give the position to someone else and they're working in partnership or sometimes product development or they just sit on the board. What has been your experience with human resources? Because you deal with a lot of people and what recommendations you have because I know that students that are watching today, mainly they're looking at even designing like this stage one, like the course launched yesterday. So they're looking at designing the logo. So they're not even, they don't even have the first paying customer. But I think it's important for us to start educating our legends with your experience. So what has your experience been? Um, maybe just a quick one before I go into people and leadership around the logo. Definitely not an important thing to start with. <laughs> start with your MVP first of yeah. what your product is like yeah. just you have to get your head away from all of this noise about like oh branding or website yeah. urls or logos or whatever yeah. cool stuff it's not about the cool stuff startups and, uh, and it will never be perfect right you can spend the next year designing a logo and you're never going to be 100 percent ready choosing the right really? business name the first 30 times you say you don't even remember your business name and it doesn't flow out of your mouth yeah right yeah. it happens to all of us or at certain point, it is an offensive word in another language. So you have to change it. Yeah. So yeah. that's happened yeah. to us as well. Like it took us like maybe three years to get into the chef in word. And it yeah. happened randomly when I was sitting in an airport in China, in a really small airport, just transiting between different flights. And I was looking because I have this sort of like a OCD sort of habit. I read every single sign. And obviously there's not that much in English in China. So I was reading every single uh, English sentence multiple times. Welcome. <laughs> and there was this thing, a business called Open In. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. Open In. I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, I have no idea because everything else is in Chinese. It just says Open In. And I'm like, oh, we're going to do Chef In. That would be amazing as a brand name. And that's how the Chef In brand came into Chef In, basically. Um, the logo actually we drew on a piece of paper and then uh, we sent it to a designer to fix it up. Because it oh, was wow. just the implementation yeah, we had, or the idea we had. It's so simple. Your logo yeah, is and beautiful. even that yeah. took five years to get to the current point where we actually had ten thousand dollars to spend on a proper designer, not a hundred bucks to design something amazing, basically. Mm -hmm. But anyway, like these kind of things just change all the time. From a yeah. people perspective, it's the same thing. You have to focus on what is core for your business. For you, yeah. you run a people business. So it is really important to hire the right mentors, to put the processes together, mm -hmm. to be actually able to educate these people, get them engaged, etc. For me, it's about running a very, very highly skilled sort of labor force of chefs, right? So we need to make sure that when they're communicated with, their time is not wasted. So whatever tech we build, 
it needs to be at the last point and fixing up the the sort of the problems and sort of minimizing the contact with the chefs. So we actually contact them very little, but every time we contact them, they'll respond 100% of the time because they don't have time. They don't want to be contacted all the time, you know, ask questions and stuff like that. We just send them a notification when the money is going to hit their account and they're like, okay, I accept it, you know. So you have to think it from that perspective. They don't want to be asked, oh, are you available on this day? Or do you want to do that? No, they just want to be told, $1,000 is going to come to your account if you accept this job on the 5th of whatever. And then the chefs are like, yes, I'm accepting it, you know. So yeah. it just really systemized and tailored towards the, the audience that you're working with. Yeah. Um, from an employee perspective, uh, you just it's really, really difficult for a startup founders to find the right team, to be honest. And the biggest challenge that I find there, at least back in the days, was the fact that people were not used to work in a changing environments. Yes. Now it's obviously differ different and you guys are networking with people with your mindset. So just build the relationships and work together on things. Uh, like the, the, you're the best employees and employers of each other, basically, right? Like if you try to hire someone for a job, they're just going to fail and you'll have to fire them. Like you, you can't get people to have jobs in startups. It's not how it works. It's, it's something that you have to have a common passion for. You have to work together to solve the problem. You have to understand each other. It's sort of like a, almost like a marriage, you know? And yes, we have it. To it becomes a family, especially when you begin, because you call them on a Sunday night and they'll call you on a Friday night. Like it's just it's such a cool experience, but it needs to be aligned. Yes, everyone the same values and be willing to like die for the cause, right? Everyone needs to be super aligned. Yeah. Yeah, and where get a common enemy. Where, where, where did you find your first few staff? Was it on freelancing platforms or was it networking events or friends of friends? Because it can get very dangerous hiring just people that you know because you think they're cool and you'd like to work with them, but they don't have the skills, which is very common. I've seen students going, oh, I'm going to give shares to my best friend or my flatmate because I think he's really cool. And I'm like, that is not how you choose a staff and business partners. Stop. And they're yeah. like, Oh, but it's really good with best friends. And I'm like, oh my God, it's getting worse. So what, what has been your experience? Where did you find your first staff and where do you find staff now? Okay. Number one point, don't give shares to anyone unless it's through a share vesting agreement. Yeah. Like four years with a one, one year gap. So the first year, no one gets anything. If they decide to fuck off or disappear, then they don't get anything. Zero, basically, because yeah. it happens in the first year, you're going to shed a lot of people. Yeah. Usually in the first three months. But if you sign them up and in three months they leave, you've lost like 5% or 10% of your business. And after a couple of these guys, investors would never invest in you. Yes, they that's the like hardest thing. The they investors, they lose trust in you. Yeah. Not having the right yes. founder. It's, it's not like complicated things. And your cap table is going to look very complicated. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. It means you don't know what you're doing, basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, meetups, uh, definitely. I found a lot of good people through meetups. Um, studying together or doing activities together. It's also a good way to bond with people, uh, find like a common enemy. If the problem that you're solving is your kind of common enemy, then that's even better, you know? You want to have some sort of a point of conversation that you can actually really enjoy. And one of my favorite rules of recruitment is if you don't want to have a dinner with someone, then don't hire them ever, <laughs> you know? You have to be able to hang out with these people, invite them to your family home on your dinner table. And these are the people that I still have in my team. Uh, all the other guys that I tried, friends and people I told, this is a very qualified person. I want to bring him on. Didn't work out. They usually go really, really burning hot out with really bad experiences. And then they start hating me. I don't have any personal oh, feelings. I don't know the corporate world. Because people in the corporate world, they think they've got the mm -hmm. title, they've climbed the corporate ladder, but they've... They've also known how to grow, but in a corporate, but often they don't have the energy that we have in the startup world. And a lot of them have commercialized things in the corporate world really well. But I find that, that the mindset of knowing that they're not going to get holidays, it's 24 hours, the energy, I find that it's very hard bringing in. I like, I find that anyone who's started a startup, when you bring them into a new startup, they're like, they're performing from day one. Anyone who's been an entrepreneur, because they know, you know, when you ask them for something, they understand the importance of multitasking, especially us in the tech world, because tech is evolving so much, right? It's almost like on a daily basis, there's a new platform, there's a new tool that will either automate or give your customers a better user experience. It's huge. So we've got one minute left. What advice do you have for first time entrepreneurs that are building a business in the agri or food space? 
find a team, a family, basically people that you want to hang out with and solve the problem together. That's probably the most important thing. Be prepared to iterate and pivot and change uh, and make sure you always focus on the problem, the big, hairy, nasty problem you have to solve and then you're going to succeed. It's that easy. And be obsessed with data. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. I think we've learned like over a hundred different, very important points, which I know that when we listen to these talks, often it's just like, oh, that sounds interesting. And then like sometimes like two years later, you'll be like, oh my God, that presentation from Academy of Entrepreneurs with Petco talked about data, human resources or investors, like <laughs> it will make sense. So guys, save this, share this, watch it again, because you guys have received over a hundred amazing tips today. So, yes, Wella, over to you. You're a mute. Sorry. So we have a question from the comments. So what might be the challenges for food production in the future? <laughs> food production. Uh, I mean, there's a few different things, right? Climate, definitely a big challenge. So how are we going to produce food or like even grow grains or anything when the temperatures are going to be unpredictable, 50 degrees outside, burning hot sun, and then there's going to be floods and all sorts of other things. That's why I was sort of mentioning about the hydroponic um, sort of farms, right? It's a controlled environment. Like I was just reading an article as well that the Arab Emirates are looking at creating a fully self-sustainable, like a glass bubble city in the desert, for example, you know? Stuff like that. So it's sometimes you, we need to think of it from a big scale to a smaller scale. But then the really hairy, hairy question here is how are we going to grow food on Mars? If one day we have to move from here to Mars for whatever reason, right? How are we going to grow the food there? So these are like really major problems. Like how can we grow food without gravitation, without sunlight, with too much water, or without any water and stuff like that. So we just need to sort of look through all of these possibilities. But climate is definitely a big problem and not to mention that the population is growing rapidly right so our resources are getting limited yeah yeah that's what we're seeing us is not just about having food it's also having the right food right i've traveled a lot this year and you see like when you're not eating properly you don't like your brain doesn't work you don't function even in the farm region so it's like it's the whole thing is about like having enough food distributing and making sure that our population is eating the right thing. Because you know that you're comfortably living in Sydney. So if you go to the supermarket, you click in an app, it can be delivered. But the importance of the right mix. I remember I had this beautiful yoga instructor and he was teaching us, like, you should always eat something that's produced around three kilometers, technically from where you live. And that's what you see when you go to the supermarket, whatever is like the vegetables or fruits of the season, they're always lower in price and they have the best flavors. And I saw, yeah. I saw a post actually this morning about the biggest Swedish supermarket, how they're no longer letting any fruits and vegetables arrive by plane. So if it's not produced locally and delivered on a truck, they're no longer going to sell it at the supermarket, which will limit what we find. But I think it's going to go back to the experience of like our grandparents' time that you had to travel to eat something new, but it's sustainable, it tastes better, and everyone wins from it. But yeah, it's very important for us to consider as well, like what we are eating. Because I see sometimes like there's many countries that I've lived and I've traveled and people are eating, but the things that they're eating is just shocking. Like it's it's almost better that they don't eat, you know, because it's yeah. destroying their health. But you know what, like you just reminded me something that I didn't think about earlier when I was sort of thinking through um, what I'm going to talk about. There's another really big problem here in the food space in particular. Um, there's no really centralized research and sort of a space and the government is not really putting the right policies so sometimes it's sort of setting people for a failure for example like the avocado farmers like um it's it's a really big problem right they produce so many tons of avocados and there's so many people producing avocados but there's not enough people to eat them what are we going to do with these avocados, you know? Because people go around and think, oh, my God, it's an amazing idea to have an avocado farm. I'm going to have 10,000 trees and I'm going to produce the avocados. And then in 10 years, then everyone's got a 10,000 trees of avocados and there's so many avocados. So how are we going to transport them to another location, right? So sometimes like not being flown by a plane is actually not a good solution. Might be better to get the, the food from Sydney and fly to Amsterdam, 
save the food, no waste, and then people can enjoy some avocados there. Well, be passionate about the avocado and use it for different things. Like you can freeze it, you can turn it into ice cream. You can like you can do so much. Like I've recently yeah. started mixing my avocado with my yogurt, and it just feels like this thick. Because when you exercise, like avocado gives you so much energy. It's so good. So I've started yeah. using avocado in different ways, not just like in the cellars like they do in Australia or in your toast for breakfast. I've started mixing it in yogurts or turning it into ice cream as well. The ice cream avocado is delicious. So it's also like repurposing. I met with some really cool startups in Chile and Chile does an amazing job with fruits and they were dehydrating the fruits to make it last longer and, and packaging and sending it to other places. It comes with yep. different benefits when you dehydrate it, but it's just amazing having these delicious fruit chips that is so much better than what sometimes we grab at like the at the convenience yeah. stores that have nothing to them and you eat them because you're hungry and then you don't feel good but with the dried fruits all these um like like it's just it's just so cool what they've done in chile it's so cool and it tastes unreal so it's also like being in love with the problem but being in love with your industry and what you're working so if you work in the avocado space be obsessed with avocado not just copying the business model of your the farmer next door because you're not going to survive. And that's what I see. A lot of people, when they're launching the business, they're scared that people are going to copy them. And I'm like, you have to think, like look at the biggest unicorns and just go, if I was like a unicorn of five different industries, how would I disrupt the avocado? Am I going to like air fry? I've seen air fried avocado with like different sauces and it's delicious. Am I going to turn it into an ice cream? Am I going to drop it on a drone? Like how am I going to do that? And when you become absolutely obsessed with your business, you start looking at innovative ways and you're not just competing with the competitors. I think true entrepreneurs are like you that are like falling in love with a problem that doesn't exist but does exist and disrupting the industry. And you're not really looking at the competitors because you're like 10 years ahead. And because of your network and your mindset and the data that you're collecting, it helps you make the right decisions along the way. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. Something very important to also remember is yeah. that ideas are pretty much useless without the execution. So you can share your ideas with as many people as you want, but if they don't have the skills to execute it like you, then they're not going to do it. And if they execute it better than you, then you're not really good at that particular yeah. topic. You better do something else. <laughs> yeah. Use your superpower because we're all good at different things and use it towards something else, 100%. Yeah, that's why we always say like the boss of your future. You're the owner of your future, but you need to action. If you're in action, you won't get anywhere. Well, um, are you okay with one more question? Sure. I'm okay, okay. with as many as you want. <laughs> We've got maybe just this one last. So how can we improve agriculture on your point of view? Because different people have not the same point of view on this. Oh, my God. There's so many problems with agriculture. When we were in lockdowns here, uh, I mean, I grew up in on farms, right? Mm -hmm. Like when I was... I don't know, five, six years old, I was picking up tomatoes and corn, uh, spending like whole days on the, on the farms and like picking up all of this food that is getting canned and distributed for the rest of Europe. Because uh, Bulgaria is a massive agriculture um, country. We have an amazing soil and amazing sort of weather, um, basically. So it's, it's, it's just crazy from that perspective. I've been exposed since, yeah, very young age. And here during the lockdowns in Australia, I went and uh, worked in a couple of farms, sort of help out the farmers, do a bit of work because there was a shortage of workers to even pick up stuff like lettuce and uh, cucumbers and like um, radish and cabbage and just random stuff, you know. So I was picking up lettuce for like, a couple of months, which was really fun. Um, and basil, basil was a bit of a pain, actually. I didn't enjoy that one that much. Anyway, so like there's so many problems. Like farmers, the poor guys, they're just randomly producing stuff. They don't know how much they're going to produce. They don't know where it's going to go or who's going to buy it. They don't at the same time often. Yeah. And if no one buys it, they just literally live yeah. it in the ground it's and just go with a tractor right. and turn it around. And I'm like, but, but I, can, I, can, I can eat these leaves, you know, <laughs> and yeah. like just pick them up or something. But they, they don't have the labor to pick them up. And if it's not perfect, they also don't pick it up because they don't mm -hmm. have the labor. No one is going to buy it. And then they're wasting their time, basically. So there's so much waste that is not even reported. Like I would say maybe half of the produce that farmers produce goes to the ground to waste. It's massive, but it's not reported anywhere because it doesn't hit any charts, any statistics, nothing. Um, so there's a lot of problems there from that perspective. Then obviously pesticides and the things we are putting in the food that come into our blood 
that actually would cause cancers in the future and other things, you know. So there is that, that importance of how are we going to reduce these pesticides and these chemicals that go in the food and going to cause our babies to grow up with like three heads or whatever, like one eye, cyclops, etc. You know, we want to make sure we reduce... crazy anxiety and energy that people have. It's from the food and these chemicals that have been putting it into our food. Because you see, like, kids that are grown close to the farm, they're a lot happier, they've got a lot more energy than the kids that are eating the processed foods or the foods that aren't well. I read an article recently because we talk about food and like feeding people, but something around 20% of food in the world, I saw this on a stat from the United Nations, is irrigated with polluted water. That means that when you eat, you can get food intoxication from the food that has managed to get to your house while you are in poverty. And you look yep. at all these things, so there's people starving, there's the wrong water, there's things getting thrown away where there's people starving, there's things making to the supermarket that aren't getting sold because it's not pretty enough. Like, it's just so many. And then after it's produced, like a banana bread, how many breads and banana breads don't get thrown away every day because it's not sold and no one wants to eat it the next day? Why aren't people discounting or building a tech that connects this leftover food? Because there's yeah. homeless in every city in the world these days. Yeah, I mean, that very, very basic solution. When I lived in the Manchester in the UK that I saw there, which I still boggles me that it's not implemented here. If you go to a supermarket in the last half an hour before it closes, everything is 80% off that it's going to expire. It was crazy. So if you're poor, you don't have money, disadvantaged, whatever, and you want to actually, even if you want to help to produce food waste, you can just go like half an hour before the supermarket closes and just buy whatever you need for like 80% off the food price. Like I've started, when I go to shop, I've started always buying stuff that are expiring and stuff like that as well. Because obviously food prices and everything is skyrocketing, but also to save the things. Because I can turn a bottle of milk that's going to go bad into yogurt. I make my own yogurt at home, for example. Or I can freeze it into ice cream for my dog. I went to the supermarket today and they have like these veggies, I'm vegetarian, these veggie burgers and they're normally super expensive and it was like 75% off and they had another week. I'm like, freezer, here you go. And it can probably stay there for a couple of weeks. Yeah, because it's the way. Yeah. And frozen, I saw this super cool technology in Mexico. They were sucking air and freezing it super fast and would last like three times longer. And yes, it did waste a lot of electricity. So that's the next thing that they're trying to solve on how to make yep. it sustainable. But it's kind of like to start solving a problem, you create another, but at least we're trying to solve and then eventually we'll be able, right? It's very hard. And we get very criticized as an entrepreneur because you're solving a problem, but you might create another one. So it's all, always important for us to measure your data and look at how can you be more sustainable in the sense of sustainability for growth, but also sustainable and responsible towards communities and the environment. So many problems, so many opportunities. Thank you so much. Amazing having you here. I learned so much. I love the space that you're in. Thank you for making time. And I hope amazing energy and karma goes back to you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you so no much for all of the tips. It was a Big pleasure. Hug. And let Thank us know how we can support Chef in as well. Big hug, see you soon.